Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And today, this is the podcast for April 30th, 2023. We're talking about Paul's mission, and we're beginning in Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3, and then 14, chapter 8 through 18. This kind of sets us off on a slightly different track than we saw in our last episode, in that there we were still in Judea. We were still with Peter and one of Jesus' disciples. And there he had that vision of the message of Jesus going out, not just into Judea, but into the Roman and the Gentile world. And here we get to see that play out in the mission of Paul. And remember, Paul is an interesting guy because he's sort of in between worlds. He's from Tarsus, which is in Asia Minor. And we're going to talk about where Asia Minor is and what's going on there today. Uh, but he's also trained in Jerusalem, and he is part of this uh, movement that's going out from Jerusalem after the resurrection and into the rest of the world. So it's an interesting sort of transition that we see in this lesson today. So my question uh, for the uh, person trained in the Greco-Roman background of the New Testament, why would they confuse Paul and Barnabas with Zeus and Hermes? And what do we do with that, Christopher? Yeah, so it, as I look at this, I think that there is a little bit of the author of Acts poking fun at the residents of Lystra. And yeah. we have we have to note a couple of things here. One is that Lystra, and we, we see later they speak in the Lycaonian language. This is in Asia Minor, so it's in modern-day Turkey, which is a Roman province, and this is where Paul is from as well. And so notice it's not at the center of the empire. It's not in Rome. It's not in Greece. It's not where these would be native gods that they would recognize. And so a little bit of the, the misunderstanding here or the okay. kind of this, that slightly poking fun is, well, he did something great. He must be Zeus because we've heard so many great things about Zeus. And if this guy's Zeus, well, who goes with Zeus? This other guy must be Hermes. And so a little bit of that misunderstanding there uh, that Paul and Barnabas have to deal with because they've done this, this deed of power in the midst of the people. So I think that's a, a little bit of why that's going on or what the author of Acts is trying to get at there. That's really helpful. It is. Well, it's kind of interesting when you think about in our context where we speak so little of God invading us in a dramatic way that um, we make those same kinds of statements where um, every once in a while you get a doctor that will say, I can't explain that. And there's a few people who will say, I can, but there are a lot of people who can't make that leap. And the doctor becomes Superman or Superwoman um, because we don't recognize a God who has made us fearfully and wonderfully and can heal and transform. Yeah, that's really helpful. It's mm. I um, because I had a book last year about preaching and humor and the Bible and humor. Yeah. I've been doing some teaching about humor and Several people are like, no, there's no humor in the Bible. I read it. It's not funny. There's nothing funny in it. And of course, I explain, well, that's because it's cross-cultural and the trans the combination of the translation. My grandparents would talk in Norwegian to each other and laugh and then refuse to translate it. Uh, it gets lost in the translation. They would say mostly they were probably talking about the people in the room, but it does. And so you do lose that like, OK, oh, yeah, this is Lystra. These are not even people who worship Hermes and Zeus. So they've heard about a foreign god. Uh, they've confused. That's really helpful. By the way, another example of that is um, I was reading an overly technical article on Ehud and Othniel. I don't know if you saw that, Christopher, in the Journal of Biblical Literature. Mm -hmm. And of course, the joke that 
Ehud is, is a left-handed man from the tribe of Benjamin. Which is Benjamin right. means son of the right hand. You know, right. So it's hilarious. Uh, or it's a just, it's not hilarious, but it's a little joke. It's a little that, joke. But there's a little joke here. So Paul and Barnabas are set aside and it's a movement of the Holy Spirit that sets them aside. What do you what do you make of that, you guys? Go ahead, Christopher. <laughs> I think one of the things that I make of it is the way in which this further confirms that Saul, remember, well, he'll, one of the things you have to you might want to talk about with your congregations is that in the first part of this, he's called Saul. And that is the name that he's introduced to us in Acts by. And then by the time we get to chapter 14, he's going by Paul, which is the name that he uses in the Greco-Roman world. So again, we've got a little bit of that cross-cultural difference there. Uh, but I think one of the things that I see is that this is a way in which the Holy Spirit is further confirming that this man, Saul, who was originally not to be trusted, is being set aside and is being confirmed for a particular task. Yeah, I was I was just going to say I and this just takes it to the next verse in terms of uh, their response to the instruction is to pray and fast. And so it, it it suggests that they heard what was expected of them and they wanted to make sure they heard correctly. Um, they didn't just make a decision. There's no way God would tell us to do that. Um, and it also isn't a, oh, well, God said it. We'll just do it. Um, it was together the community prayed and fasted and then confirmed to follow, follow through. Um, and I think that's powerful. I think it's important for us to find ways where the community together responds to the commands of God and not just one person um, making making the instruction and we say, oh, okay, if this person heard that, then that's what we're supposed to do. So yeah, I think that's really powerful. And I think it's helpful as we think about the person of Paul, because sometimes we think of him as sort of a solitary religious genius or something like that, or kind of a solitary person who's driven to start this movement. But throughout the book of Acts, we see the way in which he is continually interacting with and brought into the community of believers and that not only is he brought into that community but like we see here he is sent out by that community with prayer and fasting and when we read his letters we see he has so many co-workers and so many people who he's associated with who he's sending greetings from and sending greetings to and so i really appreciate the way you talk about there's communal discernment going on here and it's not just that paul says that i've been called and therefore paul does what he needs to do yeah, and Paul even writes his letters with co-writers. Yep. Isn't that right? I mean, what? How much that would just change our perception? Instead of saying the letter of Paul to the Galatians, I can't remember that one. I I can, don't have a paper Bible in front of me. It's hard to flip in these. But the letter of Paul and Silas, or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the book of Romans is a great example. In chapter Romans 16, we get the scribe, Tertius, writes his own message at the end of the book, the letter of Paul and Tertius, and so forth. So, and we see that throughout Acts. Uh, be aware as you read Acts with your congregation, it's very often Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Luke, or Paul and John Mark. It makes a very strong point that Paul is always traveling with other people and always working his ministry with others. Yeah, Philippians is from Paul and Timothy and so mm -hmm. on. I think that's really helpful because it helps us then maybe reminder that we all share in this. Mm -hmm. We share in the in the community that is called and sent. Um, and that that goes on, that this is our message. All right, I want to go for one uh, well, uh, let, me, let me add one more thing from a Wesleyan perspective. I'll just drop this in there in the in the idea of what it means to be held accountable, um, because our society often likes to lift up a one. And so we can forget that Paul needed the confirmation of the Holy Spirit 
and the confirmation of the community because Saul had a reputation and it wasn't particularly favorable to this particular community. But having that confirmation and that confirmation expanded and then to it, it's almost a counter reading to recognize, as you've just laid out, that Paul didn't take over. Paul in community, writing to community, writing with others. And, and so that's a very different way of receiving this message of the story of Jesus. Amen. And you were, you were going to point something else out. Yeah, this is what I was going to point out that um, in the in the what the uh, the what are they called the 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 lice in the Lycianian language? I don't know uh, these folks from Lystra. Here's what they say: the gods have come down to us in human form. They're almost not wrong. <laughs> now they see gods plural so it's hoi theoi instead of theos and but the word come down this is a word uh the greek word here is is a word that is used in the new testament for the spirit coming down on jesus and i suspect somewhere else probably for jesus and then it in human form. Now we don't need to get into Christological, uh, early Christological fighting out and hammering out of orthodoxy, but they're almost right, I guess, mm -hmm. is the point. And and uh, that's the where the disciples were before Easter. They were almost right. They didn't quite see it, right? They didn't quite know who Jesus was. They didn't quite know what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ. And so on. And so you, you see people on the way to faith. And so in humility, we can see ourselves in the, the Lystra folks and then the community also in Paul and Barnabas, maybe. I really appreciate that, Ralph, because we do need to recognize that we too are on the journey. And some of our right sounding things are only almost right. Right. <laughs> I, th I think that's an important piece. We've talked a little bit about the humility that's evident in Paul when we read this this way. Um, and I think it's only appropriate for us to recognize how do we find that that level of humi humility too. And if I may, I would just circle back to who God, the God made known in Jesus is in this text and just wonder what are the ways maybe in the transforming imagination of a community or individuals within a community, what are the ways in which God has shown up in that undeniable way that causes people to take a second look and say, God is here?